Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence this morning by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together to feast upon your word together. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would filter out all of that which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Resurrection is the general context of the chapter we've been studying. I appreciate you all participating. Uh, more than that, it is a specific context about a single resurrection and that of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was very dangerous to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the first century. Uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I'm not exactly sure what Lazarus looked like when he raised him but I assume that he looked like the Lazarus that died. In fact, our chapter is going to deal with what a resurrected person looks like. Christ risen from the dead. It was dangerous to teach that. And we, in our study here, saw that why should we identify ourselves with somebody who's dead if he didn't rise from the dead. Uh, because if he didn't rise from the dead, there's no reason to identify ourselves with him. And we wouldn't be standing in jeopardy every hour. And the problem uh, is in our present situation, we don't, we don't really understand that jeopardy, at least not here in Oklahoma. There was a a lot of physical jeopardy in the days in which this was written. People who confessed Christ were put to death, uh, like Stephen, Paul, the Apostle Paul, the human author of this epistle, was condoning the stoning of, St of Stephen simply because he taught the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul, of course, completely changed his mind after. Uh, after the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. It was physically dangerous to teach that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I don't know, folks, I don't know whether you can put yourselves in that situation or not. You know, you go to Jerusalem, you go before the high priests, and you say Christ rose from the dead. Uh, the high priests are the ones that condemned Christ before Pilate. And Pilate was the one who condemned him to death. How do you suppose these guys would feel about someone proclaiming the resurrection from the dead? I mean, do, do you suppose that Pilate ever snuck out maybe at night to look at the empty tomb? He must have, have known, Pilate must have known where Christ was buried. The soldiers came back and they told him, you know, couldn't, couldn't have been a, a very light thing to have someone, a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the face of the Jewish religious establishment of his time, preaching the resurrection of Christ in the city of Jerusalem. And there, there, there is a hate generated by Satan when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, today, there, there may, be, may not be anybody throwing stones at you like, you know, like Stephen was stoned. But, dearly beloved, 
the stones thrown at you are not really stones, but doubts. You, you not only live in a world that, that hates the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, you may be, as one of God's children, someone who has doubts concerning the power of Christ's resurrection and what that means in your life, how that applies to your personal, everyday walk, uh, fellowship, communion, uh, relationship with Christ. The stones that are hurled at you are doubts, doubts of Scripture. Probably the first stone, you know, uh, uh, probably the first stone that has written on it, well, Paul, this is what Paul thought. This is what Paul, you know, it's Paul. It's all about Paul. It's Paul's word. It's not God's word. And insidiously, you're sl you are slowly led to believe that it's, um, it's really not God's word. You know, a seemingly innocent argument. You know, the, the text that you're reading isn't really quite reliable. This is, this is God's Word, folks, whether you admit it or not. When the minister stands up and says, well, it's difficult, to, it's really hard to get Paul's thought here, you know, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you are suddenly hit with one of those stones. You know, this really isn't God's Word. And folks, you should never have that doubt. This is God's Word. God is telling us that in Paul's day, it was physically dangerous to align ourselves with a resurrected Jesus Christ. In our day, here I am today, I'll tell you what I'm reading. I'm reading, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4.11 We went through these verses. I, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Jesus, in, in, in Christ, uh, our Lord. I die every day. I die daily. The greatest opposition, the greatest suffering, if you, if you want to call it that, that I've ever had in my life, the greatest opposition I've ever had is in teaching this book. First verse of Ephesians chapter 1, the first playlist the, on our playlist, the first study we, we went through. Paul, an apostle by the will of God. Now, doesn't that say that God willed that Paul be an apostle? So why am I kicked out of a church for saying that? I didn't say it. God said it. Paul, an apostle by the will of God to the believers at Ephesus, the words couldn't be more clear. Not because Paul wanted to be. And I understand, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. But, but finish the verse. A constraint has been laid upon me. Paul didn't want to be an, an apostle. He didn't want to be an apostle. He wanted to stone Stephen. He wanted to put Christians to death. You can't possibly tell me that it was his will, Paul's will, to be an apostle. Paul was an apostle by the determinate will of God. That's what the verse says. Now, th this may not make any sense to you, but it does to me. Why do you not believe me? Because you are not my sheep. Well, doesn't that verse say that if you are not his sheep already, you can't believe? And the person says, that's, uh, that's what it looks like, but I don't believe that. I mean, how can you say that? How can you say that? They don't believe it because they, they believe that they are the ones that determined their redemption. Uh, you know, we as Christians lead and direct our own lives, you know. I mean, that kind of doctrinal hostility surrounds you, whether you know it or, or not, 
If after the manner of men I fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage was there to me that if, if, if the dead rise not, what advantage do I, do I have? I mean, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often of the Jews five times five times I received 40 stripes save one three times was I beaten with rods once was I stoned three times I, I suffered shipwreck a night and a day I've been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils by my own countrymen in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often in hunger and thirst, in fastings often in cold and nakedness. Where's any mention of beasts? Where's the mention? Where's, where does he mention beasts? If the beasts in our present study means lions and tigers and bears, you know, oh my, you know, you know. Why didn't Paul mention it here? Because they were men. After the manner of men, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. I don't think, I don't think they were, uh, that there were wild lions stalking the streets of Ephesus. I don't think that Paul fought in, in the Colosseum in Rome. At least it's not the context. But I, but I read, I do read, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. I see the beast and the false prophet in the book of Revelation. You know, these are enemies of God. Paul names Ephesus. You know, if you know if you understand anything about the city, the story, Diana of the, of the Ephesians, the riot that occurred in the city, they had to drag Paul out of the crowd. Would have killed him. Okay, he had to he had to wrestle with them to get himself away from those who would who would put him to death. You know, Paul had quite an experience at Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit calls that to mind here, so that we won't get the wrong idea. What Paul was wrestling with in Ephesus was idolatry, hatred of the gospel of Jesus Christ, hatred of his and disbelief in, in his resurrection from the dead. If, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, well, then we might as well just live our own fleshly lives our own way. You know, we eat and drink, we live, you know. Uh, today, uh, uh, we just do whatever we want, and eventually we die, and there's no resurrection, and that's the end of it. You know, that's that's what the text is saying. If there's no resurrection from the dead, you know, we might as well live a normal life and die. You know, and if that's if that's the end of it, then where's where's any meaning? And if there isn't any, any meaning in life, then, well, what does it matter? What does it matter what you do? Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts a good manner of life. Now, I don't think, I don't think that's moral. I think that's doctrinal evil communications. You know, uh, it's, you know, Instill that, instilling the slightest doubt that this is not God's Word. Instill the slightest doubt that what that verse says doesn't really mean what it says. It's not really God's Word. It's Paul's Word. Paul got confused at times. didn't know what he was writing. You know, you know anything, anything to reduce the authority, to reduce the accuracy, the integrity of the Word of God and the finished work of Jesus Christ and you folks are surrounded by that today.
You know, it, it's all about believing what God has said in His Word is true without any external evidence. You know, we walk by faith, not by sight. Don't, don't tell me you could just, if we could just find the ark, it'd be the greatest gospel tool in human history. You know, we'd prove that there was an ark and there was a Noah. You know, well, folks, I can prove that right now. It's right back there in Genesis, all right? I mean, are you telling me that a piece of rotten wood is, is greater proof than the word of the sovereign God? I, you know, I, I think that if I'd been on the waters for, you know, for 150 days, you know, and I finally hit dry ground, you know, well, it'd probably be a pretty big soggy mess. You know, I'd, I'd probably cut up part of the ark and, and build a fire, you know, because I'm on top of a mountain and it's probably cold. You know, I'd want to I'd, I'd cook some meat and, and then offer a sacrifice, you know. And so I'd, I'd probably just burn the whole thing up and there wouldn't be any ark to find. There wouldn't be anything left to find. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't know if that's if, if what happened to the ark. It, it, I, I just know there was an ark because God said so. There was an ark because God said there was an ark. There was an ark made for the children of Israel that they carried in the desert because God said so. Paul is God's apostle by the will of God because God determined it that, that he be. And this is God's word. I don't need any external proof of any kind okay, to tell me that this is God's word. I can't, I can't imagine any proof greater than the fact that my God said so. And, and if you're not saying that, saying the same thing as God, evil communications, and they're there every day, folks, every day. Doubt, you know, constantly being instilled in our minds about the truth of the resurrection of Christ, you know, His deity, that He's God of very God, and, and the necessity of His death in our place in order for us to be redeemed. You know, awake to righteousness and quit sinning for some have no knowledge of God. This is this, this in the context of the resurrection. I speak this to your shame. No knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God for? I determined that the, the very beginning of this book that we're studying, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Who is God? Jesus Christ. We preach Christ. Not, we don't preach self. We preach Christ. Jesus Christ, God of very God. And folks, I don't know whether they're redeemed or not, but they don't have any correct knowledge of God. And, and since I speak that to your, sh your shame, I assume that the Holy Spirit is saying that we ought to be teaching them that. I speak this to your shame. You know, why, with all of the evidence they have, is there a dispute about the resurrection from the dead why is that still rampant in Corinth? You know, and I, I could ask the same question, you know, in, here about Monroe, Oklahoma. Knowledge of the flesh, maybe, but not of God. I speak this to your shame, and we're back to we're back to the resurrection. Someone will say, "Well, then, how are the dead raised up?" And with uh, which body do they come or what body do they come? How are the dead? How are the dead raised up? Well, God raises them. It's God who raises us from the dead because Jesus Christ died in our place and our sins are forgiven. You know, there's no reason for us to stay dead. How are they raised up and with what body do they come? No idea. No idea. But, but let's just think about that. I mean, the translators have been honest enough to italicize the word thou. It's not there. So it just says fool. 
Not thou fool, but just fool. Fool. That which you sow is not quickened unless it dies. And I realize that our Lord said that we shouldn't call our brother a fool. I understand that. But that's a different word. Uh, it's morose. It's the word from which we get moron. This word is a different word. I, I think it's ephron uh, in the Greek. It's, um, and it means ignorant. Ignorant. One lacking knowledge. One that, one, number one, you shouldn't be that ignorant when you sow something. It, it, you know, because it doesn't come to life unless it dies. You ought to know that because these people, more than many of us, are, are planting crops every year. That which you sow, okay? You sow, not the body. You don't sow the body, but you sow a, a bare grain, naked grain, a seed. You know that. You know that when you put a grain of wheat in the ground, well, what do you get? What do you get? You get another grain? No. You get a stalk. Okay, it might be of wheat, maybe of something else, but God is the one that gives it a body. God's the one that gives it a body. And you say, with, well, with what body does it come? The one God gives it. Not one that you understand or not one that you make up. It's the body that God gives it. You know that when you sow grain, what comes up, is not the seed. What comes up is the body that, that God gave it. As it pleased Him. As it pleased God. It's the sovereign God. He's the one that designed it. And He did that to every seed. Every single seed has a designed body for it. This is very interesting stuff because God is playing off nature here. There's, there's, a, there's a new body for every different seed, a new body for every one of us. I mean, your resurrection body isn't going to be like anybody else's. We're not all going to be a mirrored image of one another, okay? Just as the grain has a designed body by the sovereign God, each for, for its own seed, so every one of us, has a designed body by God's sovereign will. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another of, of beasts, another of fish, another of birds. There are celestial bodies and there are bodies terrestrial. That's earthly, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the celestial is one. The glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one, one star differs from another in glory. God did that. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is raised because it's sowed as seed as something that doesn't look like the body that's going to be raised. What is, what is sown is the seed God gives. You know, it's, 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 this, it's this old body. And what is raised is a body according to the design of God. And you ought to know that. He's... God is saying to the Corinthians, you ought to know that. Don't be ignorant. If you sow wheat, you don't, you don't get wheat. What you, you, know, you sow a seed that dies, it germinates, and up comes a grain of wheat. Okay? And that's true of, of many different bodies. You know, and I read, uh, I, uh, I read those, uh, uh, you know, these are, are not bodies designed by anyone else but God. He's the sovereign creator. He spoke the worlds into existence. He's the one that designs the body that's raised. So, we've basically settled the question. 
What is sown is the old body. What is raised is the designed body, the, God, the body that God designed. It's the, the body by God Almighty. It's a body, okay, something like Christ's body, and we're said to be, we're said to be Christ's body now. Not that we will, you know, later become Christ's body when we raise. We are Christ's body now. I don't, I don't know what that body is, but apparently it has flesh and bone. You know, a, 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 a spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. So we are, we are to have a body like his. So we get to 42, verse 42. This is, this is the way the resurrection is. It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. And, and we know what corruption is, you know, because we see it every day. We see it all around, all around, the decay. You know, uh, we, we, we see it on every hand. Think what it means to be an incorruption. I, I, that's almost beyond human comprehension. Incorruption, no decay, no change. We are raised an incorruptible body. You know, apparently it never wears out. Raised in incorruption. You know, I wish that I had the ability, the, the, the oratory skills to try to point out to you folks just how important that is. That, that in the new creation, which you now are in Christ, there is no corruption. He that is born of God does not sin, for his seed abides in him. Whose seed? God's. If God's seed abides in you, you cannot sin. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. This incorruption is the fulfillment of that new man that cannot sin. What you look so forward to every day is the fulfillment of that new man that can't sin. For we which live are always delivered unto death, for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It is sown in dishonor. You know, think of the effects of mankind's fall into sin. You know, we grow old, our bodies fall apart, we, you know, we wear down like a, like a cheap watch, and death isn't normally a, a pleasant thought. It's not a very pleasant topic, okay? You know, the prospect of heaven is a wonderful prospect, but death not, not so much, okay? When, when the truth is, folks, there could be no life if there was not first death. Death precedes life. You know, the world thinks life begins with life and it ends with death. I got news for you, all right? It begins with death and it ends with life. Sown in dishonor. Sown in dishonor. And, you know, and so we do the best that we can, you know, to hide all of that dishonor. You know, we, you know, we, you know, we make more out of the flesh than what God does. It's sown in a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. There, there really is a, a natural body, and there really is a spiritual body. And now we come to verse 45. The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an old English word there. You know, let's put but in there. But that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterward. Afterward came that which is spiritual. You know, Satan who, who rose uh, against God. Why didn't God just annihilate Satan? I've heard that question asked a lot. You know, why didn't he just, you know, wave his hand and do away with him? You know, God could have annihilated Satan, but, but if he had, then tell me, to whom would God have shown his wrath against sin? Angels, they're all ministering spirits, but, but they're not in the image and the likeness of God. Man is. 
Why is the natural first? Well, because God determined to show His wrath against sin. What if God, willing to show His wrath against sin, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath prepared beforehand for destruction? People hate that verse. You know, they weren't, they weren't angels. They were fallen creatures in the image and the likeness of God. We read in Genesis, I, I believe chapter 5, Adam had a son in his own image. No longer the exact image and likeness of God, but with man in the image and likeness of God and Satan, our enemy, God's enemy, coming up with a duplicate, you know, God could show His wrath against sin in, in that which was purported to be the image of God. That's why these are, are vessels fitted for destruction. They were before determined to be judged and destroyed. So it was God's plan in showing His wrath against sin to place man in this place, this place we call, you know, this, this sphere, okay, of life, in the likeness and the image of God, with a will, because God has a will. The problem is Satan must have had a, had a will because he determined, he, I, I will be like the Most High, you can't do you can't say that or think that unless you have a will. So isn't it clear that there can't be a will that is not God's will if if it's ever to get along with God. But man was given a will because he's in the image and likeness of God. So now we have two wills. We got man's will, we got God's will, and the inevitable happened. It had to happen. It had to happen. It couldn't be otherwise. Those wills crossed. And that's what God is teaching us. The only way we'd have His will is if He put it in us. And we're told that He has given us His Holy Spirit. So in the new creation, we have the will of God. And it's permanent. That's basically what keeps you going. And the flesh always crosses the will of God. So that which is natural had to be first in order for God to show His wrath against sin and His mercy upon vessels of mercy which were beforehand prepared for glory. That's why the natural was first. Uh, you know, if, if Adam hadn't sinned, none of this would work. I mean, all of the plan of the sovereign God would have fallen on deaf ears. That's why I've suggested Adam was put in the Garden of Eden. He was placed there to sin. And no doubt about that, you know, that that first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And it was God who breathed into him the breath of lives. That's plural, by the way. For those of you who haven't looked at that, that's, that's plural. Now, that may be a, a plural of excellence, or it may mean that he had a soul and spirit, or it could be... A, if, the way I, I understand that, it could be that, it may be that it's, it's saying that we all came from Adam. The first man is earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Both of those are true. And I believe the Holy Spirit is giving us both concepts to stress the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son, became flesh just like us. He became incarnate that as our kinsman, he might die in our place so that there is a resurrection from the dead. As we have borne the image of the earthy, 
we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We shall bear the image of the heavenly. Because we're going to be raised incorruptible. You know, that's surely true, but you see there is a time right now, right now, when there is the image of the heavenly in us. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, you have, you don't need to, need to, you have, the text says, you have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. You have put off the old man. You have put on the new man which is created by God in righteousness and true holiness. And so we ought to walk like that. We ought to talk like that. We ought to walk worthy of our calling. You know, every Christian, it seems, would want to work, walk, walk worthy of their calling. Something that gives us glint, and, and something that gives us glimpses, uh, gl uh, even the tiniest glimpse of that new heavenly image, that new man. I believe every one of you here know, who know and love the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I truly believe you do not want to sin. You don't want to sin. But dearly beloved, you who are born of God, His seed abides in you and you cannot sin. You can't sin. I think, and I think we have an opportunity this side of glory to manifest that spiritual image that's willing to suffer reproach, suffer and bear reproach, which is to God's glory. I think you have an opportunity. I think we have an opportunity to bear witness to something that is inconceivable to those who don't know the Lord. You know, it becomes very intense beginning at verse 50. Uh, it's the passage that I think everyone's been kind of looking forward to. So next time, Lord willing, we're going to look at the, the future uh, eschatological concepts of the fact that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.